So, welcome to Stockholm, Miriam Mann. We're very happy to have you here at the Goethe Institute in Sweden. And yesterday we traveled to a school in Uppsala, mm -hmm. which is like a little bit north of Stockholm. Could you tell us something about your impressions of Sweden and how it was to come here and to meet the students? It's so much. Um, Sweden, I mean, I was very excited because I didn't know what to expect and it's my first time in Sweden. And my first impression, I would say it's, it's so clean. Um, when I reached uh, Stockholm Central Station, I wasn't sure, is this the Central Station? I'm coming from Frankfurt. Um, and then uh, Uppsala yesterday just really touched me in so many different ways. I loved the school, the architecture and everything, and just seeing how different some basics were made. One of the things that really stayed in my head and that I will be thinking about is how um, normal, gender neutral bathrooms are. Um, but then on the other hand, uh, speaking with the students and seeing how well prepared they were and how um, the, the questions and what they, yeah, what they actually think about and what what's uh, going on in their mind and what they really wanted to know from me. Um, that was really interesting and to be honest I'm also still thinking about oh I should have maybe added this or maybe said this because um, I really wanted to um, yeah be worthy <laughs> of uh, yeah of this great opportunity to talk to young people mm. in Sweden about my book. Yeah, I love the German is the, the foreign language for them, the second yeah. foreign language, and they really ask some questions of death and, and we're, they were going deep. Like, yeah. what can I do to, to fight uh, racism mm -hmm. and work more for human rights? And, and this comes from like 17 year old people in, in Sweden in yeah. German. Yeah, and also, and then there was this, you know, having having um, the students talk to me in a group, but also the ones that came to me afterwards and just wanted to have a little private chat. That was so interesting. And there was also this one pupil, she spoke about her experiences when she visits Munich and stuff like that. So that really, really touched me. Yeah. And also just seeing like the whole environment, how students and teachers interact with, with each other. It's so much more on eye level. And of course, it was just one expression of one, uh, one impression in one school. But um, I, I had the feeling it was such a comfortable and um, safe environment. And um, yeah, that, that the students were really comfortable also interacting with adults, which to me is always a really good sign in seeing um, yeah, that it, they feel safe and they're not scared and they feel comfortable in also asking and expressing themselves. So that's just a few of my impressions, but I think I could talk for an hour. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and the pastry, oh my God, the pastries. <laughs> you are, compared to me, you are very young. <laughs> and you're still a very young person, but you've already done so many things. If, you, if I do some research about you, of course, <laughs> and you were a catering entrepreneur and you catered ah, food, West African life. food in Frankfurt. <laughs> uh, you are a theater producer, theater maker, <laughs> activist, politician. You are an author since... Uh, of, of no, a novel since March this year and you also happen to have a grown-up daughter also so who's 18 years old and a son how do you cope with all that how do you all the roles that you play and uh, that you really enact in a very impressive way how do, how do you cope I don't <laughs> I don't I'm overwhelmed and I forget stuff no um I it's okay the catering thing is funny <laughs> because <laughs> I forgot that was part of my life. And um, yeah, uh, it seems like a lifetime ago, um, but it was just 2019. Um, it, it seems a lot, but it's not really that much because even though the way you put it, it sounds like I do all these different things. To me, I do the same thing always everywhere. And I think um, being someone that's very, um, curious and I love learning new things and I love entering new spaces and experiencing new things and spending time with people that I wouldn't spend time with automatically that forces you to step out of the box and your comfort zone 
And um, my therapist likes to say uh, I have world power fantasies because I always have the feeling if, if there's a, a challenge, I'm like, why not? <laughs> and, um, uh, but no matter what I do, whether it's in theater or as an activist or in politics, it's usually always trying to shed a light on certain topics that are important to me and at the same time to awaken a form of empathy. So um, I see myself as a storyteller no matter what. So as an activist, you will barely find a speech of mine which doesn't have a form of dramaturgy mm -hmm. in it. Um, and I think telling our stories is something that can empower and um, that can bring empathy from others towards us. And I think it can show us our commonalities. Um, so in theater, I try to st tell really, really good stories that matter to society. Um, in politics, I try to tell the stories of people in rooms where they aren't taking place in. Um, as an activist, the same thing. And well, as a mother, I, just really tried hard to um, keep my kids alive. And so mm. far, it's going really well. <laughs> so um, yeah, but I would like some more sleep, that <laughs> I have to admit. Have sleep. <laughs> yeah. But everything is connected, as you say. Everything and, and, is connected. And starting with the food mm -hmm. and, and getting to Issa, your novel, mm -hmm. that you, that you published in, in March this year, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also a lot of food in that novel, so, so speak a little bit about that novel, because unfortunately it's not translated yet into English, so mm -hmm. everyone who's listening, who is a publisher or whatever, <laughs> can still have the rights for Isa in English. <laughs> what is the novel about? So um, the novel is about women and identity. So um, there are two different lines of the story. And one line is Issa. Issa is uh, my hero. She is pregnant and she travels back to Cameroon where she was born for the first time in 10 years, for the first time without her mom and her family. Um, not only because her mom tells her she's supposed to go there and um, fulfill certain traditions that women have to do in, in their family, but also also because she kind of wants to, or she kind of needs a time out to really figure out who she is. And I think that's something that um, becoming a parent, identity becomes a bigger topic. Well, that's what it was with me. Like, who am I and who do I want to be for this whole new human being? So that's Issa's uh, story, basically. And she's going to, um, she lives with her grandmothers, which is her grandmother, her mother's mother, and her mother in this house. And then we have this other storyline, um, which stretches over um, approximately 100 years from 1903 to 2006, um, where I am telling the story of five generations of women ending at Issa and starting at one of Issa's four mm. mothers. Um, and that was actually the story I really wanted to write, which is um, not only about colonialism, but, um, but giving women who have been made faceless and nameless and who are barely um, part of history and part of stories and part of of knowledge, um, giving them faces, names, and an identity, and also the most important part, giving women that lived and survived colonialism their dignity back, because there are barely any stories internationally um, about colonialism, German, Cameroonian colonialism, West Af African, like what happened in West Africa, and if, even if they are, you barely have the perspective of women, mm. and um, so I always really wanted to write down their stories and make them last and also depict them in a dignified and strong way. So I wanted to create strong characters. Hmm. So yeah, that's really what the story is about I without think, trying to spoil too much. Of course not. <laughs> I loved your book because of this focus on, on black women because it contains a lot of humor as well, mm -hmm. despite all the bad things that are happening, and because it tackles the colonial history of Germany, which has not been worked with so much in German literature. Mm. So this, I think it might be one of the first books or first novels that actually do this German colonial history 
part. And um, how long did it take you to write the novel? And how much research did you do on the history of Cameroon and the German colonialism history? Mm. So um, the story was complete in my head. Um, and writing the book wasn't too much about um, writing the story, but finding the form. Um, and the first complete draft of the book, so there was, um, at first I wrote about the first 60 pages, which are also coincidentally actually the first 60 pages of the finished novel. And then um, I had this agent and then we went and we were searching for a publishing house that would want to publish it. So then I had like three months that I didn't do anything and I was waiting for um, a publishing house to make an offer and I remember I think I signed the contract in November and I um, gave in the finished first draft of the manuscript in April so about November last year no 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 no. no well so it was I um, gave the so it was November 22 okay. I signed the contract and I um, yeah I handed in the first draft in April and then you also have the editing process. So, so the editing process all together took me a year, but the editing process was, to me, that's the real work. Like really just writing down the story wasn't, didn't really feel hard, but um, I challenged myself before I started writing. So I, I had like this notes of things I wanted to do. So the first things were, I wanted a novel where the words feminism, racism, colonialism wouldn't be part of. So that already challenged me to find pictures and, and a different language to talk about something that I, as an activist, talk about every single day. And so that was already fun. And then to what you asked about the research, during writing, what I did would like look up little, little things, but the research took place about the past 15 years because as an activist, um, I really want to shed a life on anti-black racism and anti-black, even though we have um, a broad sense of what racism might look like, I think looking at specific forms of racism, whether it's anti-Asian racism, anti-Muslim racism and anti-black racism, you have to go back into history and find out where it came from. And I think anti-black racism in Europe um, stems from colonialism. And so all the research I've been doing, and that's the nice thing about Germany, you can go into our archives, you can find anything you need. So that's been happening over years. And in those years, there were always these certain stories of single females somewhere that didn't really get space, but they always stuck in my head and they always worked and lived in my head. And I was always waiting for an opportunity to tell their stories even though I don't know what their stories were, but I'm trying to put myself into their lived reality. Um, yeah, so that, yeah, to tell their stories. And then while I was writing, it was basically my research was about making sure I had my facts straight. So all historical things I um, mentioned in the book really happened that way um, because I didn't want anyone saying, oh, it wasn't as bad as you thought because uh, the dates, you got the dates wrong or something, yeah. So it grew in, within 15 years almost. Yeah, oh. yeah. Uh, you call yourself, an, in German, you say uh, intersectionale feministin. Yeah. I think in English it's called intersectionalist as yeah. only, uh, a term that goes back to the American lawyer uh, Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989 or something, mm -hmm. but also to the American historian W.E.B. E. Du Bois, yes. I think that's his name. Yes. Can you explain to those who don't know uh, what that term means, intersectional feminism or intersectionality? Yeah, um, and I would like to even go further because even though Kimberly Crenshaw is the one who coined the term, I think the first one who publicly um, shed a light on what intersectionality could be is Sojourner Truth. So we have to go back into the 1800s and Sojourner Truth spoke in a town hall um, where white women were fighting for their rights to vote. And she um, held this very powerful speech, Ain't I a Woman? So if we're talking about women's rights and we don't talk about racism that black women or women of color face, then we aren't really fighting for the rights of all women. And um, intersectionality to me means um, that 
we have certain societal norms that were created to and that may marginalize you and you can have privileges because of, of certain norms your the color of your skin your gender and you can also have disadvantages but um even though and we have to look at all these different norms and um you can also have intersections where different marginalizations come together. So as a woman, I experience sexism, and as a black woman, I experienced racism as well. So sexism and the racism on top um, kind of uh, accelerate each other. If I were um, a woman with a disability, that would be another intersection added. So I would be also a victim of ableism. And I think looking at all of this, it's not really about making people feeling bad about themselves, but I think we have to make sure if we're fighting for equality and, equi and equity, we have to look at all marginalized people. And I think we can only look at all marginalized people if we um, make sure we don't overlook certain intersections that all come together. Um, and you can also like um, experience some classism as I grew up as um, quite poor and um, having to fight uh, for education and stuff like that. That is a marginalization that I can actually overcome. Knowing that we can help others overcome certain marginalizations and my children aren't affected by classism anymore. Um, so that's, it, it's, it's not always negative is what I'm trying to do because I already, I already hear the critics in my head. <laughs> so I'm already trying to say, hey, if we know more, then we can do things to change and make, uh, make the world more equitable for everybody. Great. Uh, we live in a very interesting but also very scary time. <laughs> That's almost my last question now. In, in less than three weeks, we, we have elections in the United States, which Donald Trump might win. It looks like it. We have growing movements of right-wing extremism almost everywhere, not, not to speak about uh, wars, climate change, stuff like that. Uh, is there still a hope, <laughs> according to you, for a democratic future? We all live in peace and unison together, like John Lennon sang in his beautiful song, Imagine. Do you, are you still an optimist? Or what is your current uh, I'm not. state of mind? <laughs> well, the thing is, I have kids. You just mentioned it. I have kids. I have to have hope. It's not a choice. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, I have to have hope. But I have to tell you, my anxiety level is through the roof. Since you can, I think my anxiety level started climbing before the EU votes, uh, the, the EU election we had in June. And then in Germany, we had this three um, Landtags wahlen, which... Uh, made my anxiety level <laughs> rise even higher, ending with, um, yeah, the American election. So I have to say, I'm, um, I'm in awe and terrified at the same time. So I have to, I love what is happening with Kamala Harris and the drive that's that's happening there. I love that she was able to raise one billion dollars. Um, It gives me hope seeing that people are willing to accept change and that we have come quite far. On the same time, reading the polls, and I watch the polls almost every single day like an addict, it freaks me out that this race is closed because to be honest, I would have never believed eight years ago that I would live in a time where someone could openly say their things Donald Trump hmm. says, and still be considered um, a, a future president. So, um, yeah, that's really hard. But looking at Germany and Europe, I have to say I'm even more terrified because in Germany we have we have a history, um, and I have the feeling history is about to repeat itself if we don't take care. And also writing the book. Um, I wrote the book under the working title Sankofa, never really meaning to use it, but Sankofa is a West African saying um, from um, a, the a Ghanaian tribe, Edinkra, where you have a bird catching its egg on its back. And Sankofa says, don't be scared to, means, Sankofa means, don't be scared to go back and take what you've forgotten. 
um, freely translated, it, it means something like look into the past to understand the um, present and build a future. And I am urging everyone to go back and take what we've forgotten because we need to look back into history to understand mechanisms and structures and how things work. And um, I remember growing up in Germany and talking to my grandparents, who, who were, which were alive um, during World War II, and never really believing nobody knew. And how 1933, how, how many people were like, we didn't know, we didn't know. And that was just something that I thought wasn't possible. Today, living in Germany, 2024, and seeing how politics are shifting in almost the whole of Europe, how we are going towards the right, how we talk about human beings, how we find disgusting words to describe human beings um, looking for shelter, how we dehumanize humans. Um, I don't wonder how Hitler became as powerful as he was anymore. Even English it, people say illegal aliens. Yes. Nobody is an alien yes. on this planet. No human being is an alien. Yes. And so that really, really scares me. Mm. And being part of something that growing up was this far abstract story of my grandparents and now seeing uh, f familiar structures scares the freaking out of me. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but meeting the students yesterday, that if you meet young people like that, that gave me a lot of hope again yeah. in this world and in the future. And I think your, your children and everybody in this young generation, hopefully, yeah. The majority is, is working for a better future. And that's why I'm actually trying to focus more on working with younger people. And um, I spent the uh, past four years a lot in parliaments and in meetings with old politicians. And that kind of made me cynical <laughs> and depressive. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to pivot a little bit and, and talk more to young people because also working with young people in theater projects. Um, empower young people. Yeah, empowering, but also having them empower me. Also seeing that things like gender and race aren't as a topic as it used to be when I was growing up, how it's okay for the friends of my daughter to change their gender every three months. And she's just like, what am I calling you? And she just accepts it. And having my son tell me things like, you know what, it's not cool to comment on the body of a person except they can change it in five minutes. And I looked at him and he's 11. He's like, yeah, because if I have spinach in between my teeth, it would be great if you tell me because I can change it, but I can't lose 10 pounds in five minutes. And to him, it's just so logical. And he just says that. And it's not something I taught him. So that really, really gives me hope. Um, but then I look at the world and I'm like, please don't crush him. <laughs> so as you see, I'm dancing in between um, all the time. But yeah, young people give me hope. And I think we have to take care of this planet so they actually get a chance to change the world. I think we should listen more to you. And hopefully we, <laughs> we can listen more to you. And hopefully a lot of people listen to this. And thank you very much for visiting us. And Thank you for the invitation. You thank, you. thank you so much for having me. Go Goethe. <laughs>